This video is a speed run summary of all of the topics in the AQA A-level chemistry topic of transition metals. I've taken out all of the practice questions and the deeper explanation, so if you're learning this for the first time, you should go back to the full playlist, which is much more detailed. However, if you're looking for a final prep reminder before your end of topic test, or even your final exams, then this is the video for you. AQA defined transition metals as elements with an incomplete D sublevel in either the atoms or the ions. At GCSE, we treated the entire D block as the transition metals, and these are the elements that have their highest energy electron in a D subshell. But at A level, we refine our definition. Elements from scandium to nickel have an incomplete D subshell in their atom, so they're clearly transition metals. Then copper has a full D subshell as an atom, but when it forms two plus ions, these only have nine D subshell electrons. Zinc is not a transition metal as both its atom and its iron have full D subshells. The four key properties that you need to recall for transition metals are that they form complexes, they form colored ions, they have variable stable oxidation states and their catalytic activity. A complex ion contains a central metal atom or ion surrounded by a number of ligands. These are molecules or anions that donate a lone pair of electrons, and this is equivalent to a dative bond. We can describe the number of bonds in terms of the complex ion's coordination number. Note this is the number of bonds formed, not the number of ligands, as some ligands can make more than one bond. When you draw the complex ion, you should ensure that the lone pair that's bonding from each ligand is visible. Arrows go towards the central metal species. The square brackets demonstrate that the charge applies to the whole ion, not just the central metal species. This hexa aqua copper 2 plus ion has a coordination number of 6. Ligands can be both neutral molecules or anions, they just need a lone pair of electrons. They can be classified according to the number of bonds they make as monodentate, bidentate, or polydentate. Water and ammonia are monodentate ligands of similar size and no charge, which can replace one another in substitution reactions. You might expect six ammonia molecules to replace six water molecules, but this is incorrect. Instead, we only see partial substitution with four ammonia molecules replacing four of the water molecules. A chloride ion is a larger ligand and four of these will replace six water molecules. This leads to a change in coordination number. It also changes the overall shape of this complex from octahedral to tetrahedral. And this is accompanied by a colour change from blue to a vibrant green. Similar reactions also occur with complex ions containing cobalt and iron. You may need to write equations for the substitution reactions and explain how the different size of the ions leads to a change in shape. So here, chloride is a bigger ligand, so only four ligands can fit around the metal iron. You should specifically know about heme, which is an iron 2 complex with a multidentate ligand. Oxygen forms a coordinate bond to the iron 2 in hemoglobin, and this enables oxygen to be transported in the blood. Carbon monoxide is toxic because it replaces oxygen coordinately bonded to the iron 2 in hemoglobin. Cyanide and thiocyanate ions are not named examples in the specification, but they do appear quite frequently, so it's worth being aware of their existence and that they're monodentate. The two bidentate ligands you should be able to recognise and draw are the ethane dioate ion, also sometimes known as oxalate, and the ethylene diamine molecule, which is abbreviated as EN in sketch diagrams. For each of these, you should be able to recognise and draw the ligand, as well as identifying the lone pairs that allow it to bond. EDTA, or ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid, is a polydentate or multidentate ligand that forms six dative bonds using nitrogen and oxygen atoms with lone pairs. You should be able to write substitution reactions for any of these bidentate or polydentate ligands replacing the monodentate ligands in a complex. We learned in the thermodynamics topic that in order for reactions to be feasible, either they need to be exothermic with a negative enthalpy change, or they need to cause a large positive increase in entropy. When a bidentate ligand such as ethylene diamine replaces a monodentate ligand such as water, four particles, the three ethylene diamine ligands and the one original complex, are replaced by seven, the six substituted ligands and the one new complex. This increase in the number of particles increases entropy and makes this substitution extremely feasible, and we call this the chelate effect. Likewise, here we can see ethylene diamine replacing six ammonia ligands. 
the entropy change is large and positive, so the change in Gibbs free energy is negative and the reaction is feasible. The next part of the topic is shapes, and unlike the AS bonding topic, we only need to remember four shapes. Octahedral ions like hexaaqua ions have a coordination number of six, and this could be caused by six monodentate ligands, three bidentate ligands, or one hexadentate ligand, or a combination of them. If there's more than one type of ligand, then this can lead to isomerism. If the ligands are monodentate, then it's possible for the complex to show cis-trans isomerism, depending on whether the ligands of the same type are adjacent or not. If the ligands are bidentate, then it's possible to have optical isomerism. These optical isomers or enantiomers are mirror images of one another. As you know from your organic chemistry, these are going to respond differently to plain polarised light in that one of them will rotate the light one way and one of them will rotate the light in the opposite direction. When chloride ions replace water molecules in a hexaaqua ion with copper 2 plus or cobalt 2 plus or iron 2 plus at the centre, or when they replace ammonia molecules or hydroxide ions, then their larger size means that only four ligands can surround the central metal ion. This leads to a tetrahedral complex. Square planar complexes are also seen where there are four bonding ligands, but usually only when the central ion is nickel or platinum or silver. The one named example is the platinum 2 complex cisplatin, which is used as an anti-cancer drug. As the name would suggest, it's the cis isomer. There is also a trans isomer where the chloride ions are on opposite sides of the complex. Cisplatin prevents DNA replication in cancer cells by a ligand replacement reaction with DNA in which a bond is formed between platinum and a nitrogen atom on guanine. Even though cisplatin is a medicine, it can still cause damage to healthy non-cancerous cells as it may attach to the DNA in those cells too. However, the benefits outweigh the risks when somebody has cancer. The final shape that you need to know about for complex ions is linear, and a good example of this is Tollens reagent, which you encountered as a test for aldehydes. Transition metal compounds have characteristic colours. At GCSE, you met the sodium hydroxide precipitation test, which gives a dark green iron 2 hydroxide precipitate, a rusty orange brown iron 3 hydroxide precipitate, and a blue copper 2 hydroxide precipitate. Solutions appear coloured due to the way they absorb certain wavelengths of white light while transmitting other wavelengths. This is because within the atom, d electrons are able to absorb light of a specific wavelength and move to a higher energy state, but they can only do this if the d subshell is incompletely filled. We can calculate the energy change for this process by using Planck's constant. Transition metal complexes may change colour due to changes in oxidation state, coordination number and the ligand, because all of these will change the amount of energy absorbed. The coloration of these complexes can be used to identify the concentration of a solution using a colorimeter. White light is shone through the sample and the absorbance at a particular wavelength is detected. Samples of known concentration are used to generate a calibration curve and the sample can then be compared to that curve to work out what its concentration is. Transition metals are well known for having multiple stable ions with different charges due to their multiple stable oxidation states. An oxidation state is a number that we use to represent the number of electrons lost or gained by an atom of an element when it forms a compound. As you can see, all of these transition metals have multiple stable oxidation states, with the ones in bold being the most stable of all. Vanadium is a classic example, and it has four stable oxidation states, which you should be able to identify in neutral compounds as well as in ions. Vanadium can be reduced from an oxidation state of plus 5 to plus 2 by reducing agents such as zinc or aluminium, and you need to be able to write half equations for each step of this process, so it helps to be able to work out what the oxidation state of vanadium is in a particular complex ion. Yellow dioxovanadium ions contain two oxygen atoms, each with an oxidation state of minus two, and this taken together with vanadium gives the complex ion an overall charge of a single positive, so therefore the vanadium has an oxidation state of plus five. To make blue oxovanadium four cations, we've got one oxygen now, which still has an oxidation state of minus two, 
and the whole iron has a charge of 2 plus. So therefore, vanadium has an oxidation state of plus 4. Now, in order to make this half equation balance, I need to think about the charges and the oxygen, any hydrogen, any electrons. So here I can see that in order to make the oxygen balance, I'm going to need to add a water molecule. And then in order to make that work out, because I've, of course, added two hydrogens as well as an oxygen, I'm going to need to add two hydrogen ions. And then to make the charges balance, I add a single electron, which also helps to sort out the oxidation states. If we use zinc as our reducing agent, when zinc is oxidised, it loses two electrons to form Zn2 plus ions. But I can't join these two half equations together if the electrons don't balance. So first, I need to double up my first equation, and then that allows me to cancel out the electrons in each of these equations. If I join these together, then I then get an overall equation, which looks like this. Likewise, you should also be able to write ionic equations for each of the subsequent reduction steps. If you're wondering why transition metals exist in different oxidation states at different time and there isn't a single most stable version, it depends on the conditions they're in and also the ligands they're bonded to. So in general, acidic conditions favour reduction and alkaline conditions favour oxidation because they're going to affect the position of the equilibrium. You need to be aware of the use of Tollins reagent to distinguish between aldehydes and ketones. To make the Tollins reagent, we take some silver nitrate solution and add a tiny amount of sodium hydroxide, which makes it slightly alkaline, and that causes a precipitate of silver oxide. You then add enough dilute ammonia to redissolve that precipitate, and you make this diamine silver ion. Now, because the solution is alkaline, it's possible for this aldehyde to be further oxidised to make a carboxylic acid, or at least to make a salt of the carboxylic acid. And that doesn't happen if you've got a ketone, because it can't be oxidised any further. So as the aldehyde becomes oxidised to make the carboxylic acid, the silver is going to be reduced. And in picking up an electron, the silver ion within this diamine complex is going to turn into atomic silver, which isn't soluble. So therefore we get a precipitation and we get this lovely silver mirror. Titration is an analytical technique where we use the concentration of one substance which we do know to work out the concentration of a second substance which we don't. Unlike an acid-base titration, a redox titration doesn't require the addition of a pH indicator because these titrations are self-indicating. We're adding either a reducing agent or an oxidising agent, and then based on the oxidation state of the transition metal present in the reaction, as it changes oxidation state, it changes colour and therefore the reaction self-indicates. Manganate ions are frequently used as a redox indicator because potassium permanganate is this really vibrant purple colour, but as the manganese is reduced from plus 7 to plus 2, it becomes colourless. In order for this reaction to proceed as it should, the potassium permanganate needs to be acidified using sulfuric acid. If we don't have acidified conditions, then the reaction won't proceed as it should, but also we may form manganese dioxide, which is a black or dark brown precipitate. The choice of acid is also important. A weak acid doesn't provide sufficient hydrogen ions. Hydrochloric acid contains chloride ions, and these are oxidised by the manganate ions, and that means we would end up adding too much manganate. Likewise, nitric acid is itself a good oxidising agent, and so if we use that, we end up adding too little manganate. Manganate ions are regularly used to identify the concentration of iron in products such as iron tablets, but also vegetables like spinach or thyme. We can also use manganate ions in order to identify the concentrate of ethane dioate ions. This occurs in the same way as with the iron 2 plus, so we have that same colour change where we start off with a colourless solution and then when the potassium permanganate is in excess it stays purple. But one thing you should note with this reaction is that because both the manganate ions and the ethane dioate ions are negatively charged, they will repel each other and therefore the reaction is slow to begin with and so it has to be heated to about 60 degrees. But once it gets going, this is an autocatalytic reaction and therefore it speeds up on its own. Transition metals and their compounds can act as catalysts both when they are in different phases to the reactants and when they're in the same phase. Catalysts are chemicals that speed up the rate of a reaction without being used up or changed themselves in a permanent way. They do this by providing an alternative pathway with a lower activation energy. Not every transition metal is an appropriate catalyst for every reaction. How effective a catalyst is will depend on how strongly it makes temporary weak bonds while changing oxidation state. While changing oxidation state, transition metals easily gain and lose their 4s and 3d electrons, allowing them to make weak bonds. We commonly see solid transition metals or transition metal compounds used as catalysts for reactions in which the reactants are either gases or aqueous solutions. 
the way in which the transition metal reduces the overall energy requirement for the reaction is by breaking it down into a number of smaller steps, which occur at active sites on the surface. Remember, that term doesn't just apply to enzymes. The key parts are adsorption, in which the reactants adhere to the surface of the transition metal, bond breaking and making, followed by desorption, in which the transition metal lets go. Very often, the transition metal will be milled into tiny particles, which are then applied to a support medium in order to maximise the surface area and minimise the cost. Vanadium pentoxide is used as a catalyst in the first step of the contact process, which is used to make sulfuric acid. We take vanadium with an oxidation state of plus five, and it's reduced to an oxidation state of plus four in the formation of sulfur trioxide. Then this comes together with some more oxygen to restore the original vanadium to its plus five oxidation state. Platinum and the other platinum group metals are commonly used in catalytic converters in vehicles in order to reduce the production of carbon monoxide and also oxides of nitrogen. But these catalysts can easily be poisoned by lead or sulfur impurities, and this makes it necessary to remove these from fuel. You should also know that iron is necessary as a catalyst in the harbour process in order to reduce the energy requirements. In order to prevent the poisoning of catalysts, which reduces the efficiency of the catalysts and therefore has cost implications, reactants need to be purified before they come into contact with that. There are also many examples where the reaction between two ions in aqueous solution is catalyzed by the presence of a transition metal ion or a transition metal compound ion. This is particularly likely to be the case where you have two anions reacting, where because they both have a negative charge, they're repelling each other, giving the reaction a very high activation energy. But if a positively charged transition metal cation is present, then both of the ions are attracted to this, and therefore the reaction can occur via this intermediate. So in this example, the iron two plus ions act as a reducing agent and reduce per sulfate ions to make sulfate ions. And this leads to the production of iron three plus. But then that iron three plus acts as an oxidizing agent and oxidizes iodide ions. So we get back the original iron two plus ions and we also have some iodine produced. So if we remove the catalysts from this, then we get an overall ionic equation in which the iodide ions react with the per sulfate ions to make sulfate ions and iodine. It's also possible for a transition metal ion to be catalyzing a reaction in which it's made, and we call this autocatalysis. We can identify it by looking at a graph of concentration over time, because to begin with, the reaction proceeds quite slowly, but then it speeds up, which is incredibly rare because collision theory tells us that as reactants are used up, we would expect a reaction to slow down. But what's happening here is that as the product is made, that acts as a catalyst and speeds the whole thing up. An example of an autocatalytic reaction is the oxidation of ethane dioric acid by potassium permanganate. To start with, we have manganese in two different forms, the monatomic ions with an oxidation state of plus two, and also the manganese with an oxidation state of plus seven in the permanganate ion. Because the permanganate ion is reacting with ethane dioric acid, this is under acidic conditions. In doing this reaction, the monatomic manganese ions are going to be oxidized to three plus ions. And those three plus ions are then going to be able to interact with the ethane dioate anions and return the manganese to a plus two oxidation state, also producing some carbon dioxide along the way. Thank you very much for watching and I hope that this was a useful revision reminder for you. Don't forget I do have a playlist of full length videos going over all of this in a lot more detail including those redox titration calculations. So don't forget to like and subscribe for more A-level chemistry videos coming soon.